San Antonio firefighters out on the west side, just west of downtown, fighting two house fires that were burning at the same time. Our Alyssa Cole is live at that location where firefighters are working. Alyssa. Yes, I'm here on West Elmira Street downtown near I-10, and the firefighters just explained to us that the fire is 100% contained. These two houses here you see on your screen right now, investigators are trying to figure out where the fire started, if it was in the house to the left or to the right, but they have told us the houses are vacant and no injuries are reported. Now, there was heavy damage to both of the fires, I mean, excuse me, to both of the homes, and the crews are working on ventilating the smoke out of the two homes right now. And as soon as we get more details, we'll be sure to let you know and we'll update them on our website at KSAT.com. Alyssa Cole, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Alyssa. Meanwhile, it has been a busy 24 hours for San Antonio police officers. They responded to several shootings, two of which were deadly. Jonathan Cotto reports police don't believe any of those shootings, though, were related. It all started last night when San Antonio police were called out to the 900 block of Guadalupe Street on the city's west side shortly after 6 p.m. Upon arrivals, they found a, a, a victim, a Hispanic female uh, in her mid-20s. Uh, with multiple gunshot wounds. Police say it began after a car pulled into the parking lot of this picnic. They had a verbal argument. Uh, the driver of the silver sedan uh, shot the victim multiple times and the suspects all got back in the vehicle and they fled east, uh, westbound on El Paso. The woman was taken to Brook Army Medical Center where she later died. We set up uh, a quadrant and uh, search area but have not been able to locate the uh, suspects yet. Then around 1030, police say 18 was walking along the 500 block of South Chupaderas when a car stopped at the intersection at West Cesar Chavez and started shooting. The suspect took off and the victim was taken to University Hospital where he later died. Then an early morning fight between a couple outside a West Side apartment ended with an innocent bystander getting shot. Police were called to the Military Cove apartments off of Military Drive around 2.30 this morning. They say a woman and a man were arguing in the parking lot when the woman grabbed a gun and started shooting, hitting a woman who was standing in the doorway of her apartment. She was taken to the hospital in stable condition. Police continue searching for the suspects involved in all three shootings. Reporting Jonathan Cuoto, KSAT 12 News. Looking ahead to tomorrow, we are now just a few hours away before you can cast your vote for the midterm elections. Early voting begins tomorrow, October 24th, and runs through November 4th, Election Day. Of course, November the 8th, there are several big races happening right here in Bear County that we'll be following, including the race for county judge. If you want a complete breakdown of the races and Who's on the ballot this time around? Just scan that QR code you see on your screen. It'll take you right to our election coverage on KSAT.com. There you can access information about all the candidates and more about what you need to know before you head to those polls. Other stories we're following this Sunday. A woman battling ALS is hoping to shed light on the medical care gaps in coverage. Laura Tiplett was diagnosed with ALS in 2019. Her diagnosis has stripped her of her motor function and ability to speak. She now communicates through eye gaze. Her husband Jack and her mother have turned into her permanent caregivers. Jack says her diagnosis came with little to no help and much of the treatment Laura's on to slow the progression of her disease is extremely expensive. That particular drug is gonna be as well as Radicava. So already what would have cost us the 125,000, yes. there's another 158,000 because they go together. One's not separate, so you don't get off of one and the other will take over from there. Now coming up tonight on the night, Pete, you'll hear more from Laura and Jack as Laura shares what she wants people to know about her battle with ALS. Around Texas, police in Dallas have charged a 30 year old man with capital murder for a deadly shooting inside of a hospital. The suspect, Nestor Hernandez, accused of fatally shooting two people yesterday morning. A hospital police officer reportedly confronted Hernandez and shot him, injuring him. Right now, details as to what led up to that shooting have not been released. Police say Hernandez was on parole for aggravated robbery and was wearing an active ankle monitor. Russian forces continue to target Ukraine's infrastructure, including power stations. On Saturday, 33 Russian missiles were fired at Ukraine, 
but more than half of them were shot down. ABC's M. Wynn now with the latest. As the war in Ukraine continues, concerns about attacks on its infrastructure. On Saturday, Ukrainian Air Force officials said 33 missiles were fired at the country, but 18 were shot down. Local authorities claim the strikes were aimed at energy facilities, which has caused power outages, resulting in more than a million people across Ukraine reportedly left without power. In his nightly video address, President Volodymyr Zelensky urged Ukrainians to limit their use of electricity, adding they're working to bring the power back as soon as possible. He also praised the Air Force for defending the country's skies. In the Donetsk region, troops using the cover of trees to avoid possible Russian attacks. Our enemy have many, many um, weapons and uh, artillery. We don't have a lot of artillery. We have, uh, most of the times, we have problems with tanks and artillery. They claim Russian drones are keeping a constant lookout from the skies. Further west in Kherson, residents told by Russian authorities to leave immediately ahead of an expected advance by Ukrainian troops. We held on to the very end, this man says. It is now dangerous and very loud there. A Russian official says an estimated 25,000 residents left. Images from Russian state TV reportedly show people leaving on boats. Meanwhile, the Russian Defense Ministry says its forces repelled a Ukrainian attempt to break through its line of control in the Kherson region. Karina Mitchell, ABC News, New York. Shifting gears now to lighter news back here in the United States. Good news if you're still holding out hope of winning the Powerball jackpot. It is still up for grabs. That jackpot is now up to $610 million, the eighth largest jackpot in Powerball's 30-year history. The Powerball jackpot jumped over the $600 million mark after no one matched all those numbers drawn last night. The $610 million prize has a cash value of $292 million. The next drawing set for tomorrow. Still to come on the news at 530, a major hurricane slams into Mexico, packing powerful winds where that storm made landfall and where it's headed now. Hurricane Roslyn is on the move after making landfall in west central Mexico. Take a look. There are reports now tonight that at least two people have died as a result of that storm. The category three major hurricane making landfall near Santa Cruz with winds of 120 miles per hour, according to the National Hurricane Center. As a result, Roslyn now rapidly weakening as it pushes its way inland over the mountainous terrain of western Mexico. However, some hurricane warnings are still in effect in that area. Thankfully, nothing like that here at home. However, upper level moisture from Rosalind is actually already influencing some of the weather we're seeing here in South Texas. And that will be a trend as we head into the first day of the upcoming work week. Mostly cloudy skies have been found out there this Sunday. It also has been incredibly breezy as well. Let's get you a quick check at the radar, though, for some of that upper level moisture from Rosalind, creating a few light showers across portions of the hill country, stretching over to the Rio Grande. That will continue to be the theme into the evening as well as that breeze. We've seen some wind gusts upwards of 25 to 30 miles per hour. We'll have a full check at that forecast and those rain chances after the break. All right, in that last segment, we talked about Hurricane Roslyn and the impact it's having on Mexico. Mia is here to tell us how it's going to impact our weather as we head into a new week. Absolutely. Yeah, the biggest thing that we're going to find from Roslyn is going to be that upper level moisture that is already filtering in to parts of south central Texas. That combined with our next cold front is also going to fuel a couple of chances to find some rain and thunderstorms here over the next 36 to 48 hours. So here's the latest on Roslyn. Now a tropical storm. It is rapidly weak. Weakening again, thanks to the higher elevations out in Mexico. Winds at about 45 miles per hour, gusting upwards of 60. It is moving to the northeast pretty quickly at 20 miles per hour. It is expected to continue that weakening trend here over the next 12 to 24 hours. But because of that elevated moisture that's already filtering in to parts of our area, you can see that we do have the potential of some light showers out there across portions of the hill country just to the west of Kerrville, stretching over to Real County. As 
as well as eastern Edwards County and even a few showers there close to the Del Rio area. I do think that could be a trend here as we head into the evening hours, but you can see here as we head into our Monday again, Roslyn continues to weaken, but this yellow and orange color is some of that rain making moisture that will continue to work its way into our area. Combine that with an area of low pressure moving in from the west as well as our next cold front, and that's what's going to spark these next few chances to find some scattered rain and thunderstorms. Now, unfortunately, it's not going to be for everybody here by the time all is said and done, but let's take a look at the future cast and what we could potentially find out there on the radar here over the next couple of days. So as we head into the evening, some additional light showers possible generally to the west of the San Antonio area. Better chances of finding some of that light rain across the hill country stretching back over to the Edwards Plateau. But as some additional energy from Rosalind works its way into South Texas through the overnight hours, it is possible that we find some scattered rain, maybe an isolated rumble of thunder or two work its way farther eastward by wake up time and morning drive time tomorrow. Not for everybody there either, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to at least take the umbrella with you for the morning commute and drive to school. But do know that not everybody's going to need to use it. We'll start off with more cloud cover in the morning. Maybe some of that breaking up into the afternoon hours more on an isolated basis throughout the second half of our Monday. But watch what happens here by Monday night as we finally see this next front approach from the north and the west near the San Antonio area between about 9 to 11 p.m. Monday night. We are expecting a broken line of rain and thunderstorms to form that continues to push farther down to the southeast as the front moves southeast and that moves closer to the coast before the sun comes up on Tuesday morning. Now it is still a low end concern, but the storm prediction center has slightly upgraded the chance to find an isolated strong to briefly severe thunderstorm or two with Monday's activity a two out of five risk for the central southern and eastern reaches of our area. Primary threats there being some instances of gusty winds can't completely rule out a little bit of isolated hail, maybe a brief spin up, but that is the lower of the concerns with the activity. We're going to be keeping eyes on here over the next 36 to 48 hours. Again, it's not for everybody potentially missing out, especially farther down to the Rio Grande for most a tenth or two of an inch upwards of a quarter of an inch, maybe half of an inch the farther north as well as east that you go. And then we could find a few localized higher totals southeast, depending on if we find a few stronger storms. So we will continue to keep eyes on that. Of course, KSAT Weather Authority app, a great tool to have here into our Monday. It will be plenty windy on Tuesday, gusts upwards of 40 to 45 miles per hour. So definitely keep those Halloween decorations secured. I've been fighting my ghosts that have been stuck in my tree for several days now. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Larry, Dak is back, much to the delight of Cowboys fans. Yeah, and you know what? He returned after missing five straight games because of uh, a right thumb injury. Cowboys offense took a little while to get going, but once they did, they didn't look too shabby, and Dak shaking off that rust today. Plus, in the college game, UTSA tight end Oscar Cardenas loves to make sensational catches and pressure-packed moments. Coming up. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys starting quarterback Dak Prescott returned to action today, playing for the first time since week one when he suffered a right thumb injury against the Buccaneers. Now, the boys often struggle in the first half here. Dak finds Noah Brown inside the 10, but Noah's up in it and fumbles the ball. It's recovered by Detroit. The Lions led 6 3 at halftime. Early fourth quarter, Lions down 10 to 6 on the boys' one yard line, but Jamal Williams lost control of the ball after being hit by Tank Lawrence, and the ball is recovered by Cowboys Anthony. Anthony Barr, one of five second half turnovers for the Lions. Fourth quarter now closing two minutes. Prescott finds tight end Peyton Hendershot on National Tight Ends Day for a touchdown. Dak's first TD pass of the season, and the Cowboys win, and Dak's return 24 to 6. Yeah, I felt great. Um, I felt comfortable with everything. Uh, thumb definitely didn't bother me. Wasn't a thought in my head. Uh, felt like after a few throws, um, yeah, I was I was back into it. Um, and that 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 drive before uh, halftime, um, I felt like I, I made a few that just said, "Hey, we're 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 good to go. Don't think about anything again." And um, 
Yeah, so I felt fine, but this is about the team. This is a great team win. Uh, this is what I've been watching for the last five weeks, this defense, the special teams, um, and just us playing complimentary football, and it was just uh, it's just great to be back and be a part of it. It's great to have Dak back. Uh, it's always great to have four out there. I know he missed, missed being out there with us, and, and uh, you know, he came out did his thing today. Dak went 19 to 25 for 207 yards and one touchdown pass. The New York Giants won in Jacksonville today, 23-17, stopping the Jags from scoring a touchdown on the very last play of the game. And the Texans are playing at the Raiders right now, and the Raiders are up 38 to 20 late in the fourth quarter. We'll have more tonight on Instant Replay. UTSA beat North Texas yesterday 31-27, taking over sole possession of first place in Conference USA with a perfect 4-0 record. Tight end Oscar Cardenas from Brandeis High School turned in the catch of the game with this huge one-handed snag for a 33-yard gain on the Roadrunners game-winning drive. Look at that again. The 6-foot-4 tight end used every inch of his frame and then some to secure one of the top receptions in UTSA football history. Frank told me to get open. If I had to step on him, he was going to throw to me. Um, I was glad I could make a, a good second-level release, so once I had to step on him, I, I knew he could make the catch. I told him if they're going to play a certain coverage, he got to take the middle of the field and will come his way. Sure enough, they did, and I don't know how he caught the ball, but definitely glad he caught the pass, and uh, you know, Oscar's clutch when it, comes, when it comes down to it. Oscar's phenomenal catch set up this Frank Harris, the JT Clark 10-yard game-winning touchdown. UTSA will now enjoy a very much-needed bye week and will next play Saturday, November 5th at UAB. Friday night, the big game coverage road trip into the Davenport High School where the Wolves beat Lampasas 55-34 in a District 13-4A Division I contest. Wolves junior quarterback Tristan Hamlin went 12 of 21 for 233 yards and four touchdown passes, two of those to Emmett Griman. With the win, the Wolves improved to 7-1 overall and 2-1 in district tied for second behind Canyon Lake. The first year varsity program beat a very solid team in the Badgers. In this building, we know like we think we're the best team every week, and we just went out there and did what we did. Nothing special, just played our football, and I mean, it showed tonight. How much did those two years of JV, particular last year, because you guys played a tough schedule, prepare you for this season? Yeah, I mean, last year, we, although it was considered JV, we still played all of our city opponents. So, I mean, we played Shiner, they won state back to back years, and it really helped us with experience and like learning what varsity football is all about. Davenport will next play at Burnett on a Friday the 28th before closing out the regular season at home November 4th with Marble Falls. After rolling through the USL Championship regular season, San Antonio FC earned a bye week before hosting a playoff match next Saturday. SAFC finished the regular season 24-5-5 with a league-best 77 points. They also tied for league record in wins with 24 and shutouts with 17. And this is a great time for them to heal up, stay mentally sharp, and prepare for what's coming next as the intensity and in play on the pitch will certainly ramp up as teams are looking to knock them off. We are taking the weekend off maybe mentally as, as far as games go, but physically and uh, c as far as what we're preparing for, it feels like it's a weekend on um, in the sense that we're, we're not going to take any time that we have for granted. It's all about preparation, uh, mind, body, spirit for, for what's going to come next weekend. That is great to hear. San Antonio FC will host a Western Conference semifinal match on Friday, October 28th, 7.30 p.m. at Toyota Field, opponent to be determined. It's still very early on in the NBA season, but so far so good for the Spurs on the road where they're now a perfect 2-0. Last night they won in Philly, 114-105. The night before they beat the Pacers in Indy, 137-134. The young combo of Devin Vassell and Kelvin Johnson looked good against the Sixers. Vassell scored a team-high 22 points and Kelvin was next with 21. Winning on the road is always a great feeling and just what this young team needs. It gives a lot of confidence for us. We're a young group, so you know, at the end of the day, that's just going to help us out. And you know, we'll we'll celebrate this win right now. But at the end of the day, we got 79 more games. You know what I'm saying? So we're looking forward to going to Minnesota and doing the same thing. Spurs will play at the Timberwolves tomorrow night at seven. Starting off with a long road trip there, Larry. Yeah, four in a row. All right, thanks, Larry. We'll be right back. All right, not for everybody, but scattered showers possible overnight tonight. And again, Monday night with our next cold front. Overall, tomorrow's muggy, starting off in the 70s, finishing in the 80s. And then Tuesday, Tim, plenty windy. We've got that cooler and drier air moving in ahead of a next front by early Friday. All over the place this week. Thank you, Mia. Thank you for watching. We'll see you back here for the night beat tonight at 10. Until then, have a good evening.